I'm Jim Reeves. Welcome to Medical and Medical Response's continuing education program, Stellar Patient Care Reports. Today we're going to talk about assessments, documentation, medical necessity, and PCRs. This is a screenshot of ESO, our ePCR product. As you can see with the uh, stickman uh, chart, this is where we would do a head-to-toe assessment on any injuries or, or any uh, thing we take notice of on an extremity or body part uh, in the, with the patient that has a condition. Starting October 2015, uh, healthcare is migrating away from the ICD-9s to the ICD-10 codes. This is important because we're going from 3,000 plus codes to about 10,000 codes. So in the old days when we would describe uh, patients complaining of pain in the right arm, uh, there would be an ICD-9 code for that. But now with the invention of uh, ICD-10 codes, we have to describe in exact detail the exact location on the arm uh, for that to be coded properly. So if we do it the old way and just say right arm pain, they may, the M Medicare or Medicaid may deny payment on the claim because we haven't described in detail the exact location. When we're doing neurological examinations, we need to look at the mental status of the patient. Historically, we're taught in EMT and paramedic school to look to see if a person is alert to verbal, painful, or unresponsive, or person, place, day, and event. So when we describe a patient as ANO times four, we are implying that they are alert and oriented times four with no neurological or cognitive deficits. Many of us as EMS providers fail to realize that there are cognitive deficits present. So we need to take a deeper look. We need to look at their general appearance, their speech and language patterns. Do they have a deteriorated mood? What are their thoughts and perceptions? Is their information relevant to thought content? What is their insight and judgment? Again, we're looking for cognitive function, their attention and memory. We're looking for cognitive deficits. When you think about how law enforcement officers work when they're performing a DUI traffic stop, they have the suspect out of the vehicle in front of the patrol car, and they're asking them to do a set of cognitive function tests. May ask them to count from backwards from 10 or recite the alphabet backwards. All they're doing is testing the uh, individual's cognitive function. Why is it that law enforcement officers can do this, but we as EMS providers fail to, to do that? So we need to start thinking like that and performing these cognitive function tests. You can ask a patient to uh, remember a number and then ask them throughout the transport if they can recall that number. We need to ask them other questions besides just person, place, day, and event because a lot of these patients, uh, especially the ones that have confusion or dementia set in, will still remember who they are, where they're at, what day it is, and what event. We all know who the president is. So these are, these are not very good questions when we're assessing cognitive function or looking for cognitive deficits. Many patients with dementia and confusion no longer recognize what is appropriate behavior. We need to be looking at these patients to see if there's presence for agitation, aggressive or abusive behavior, if they're using curse words or obscenities that are inappropriate or at the wrong time, uh, unusual public sexual behavior, making strange noises, deterioration in mood or rapid mood swings. All of these are indicators that dementia has set in. Many times though, when we document a patient as ANO times four, we're failing to capture the fact that the patient may have some dementia or confusion present. Let's talk about Glasgow Coma Scales. Many of us use the Glasgow Coma Scale on a routine basis every day. As a matter of fact, it's required in our EPCR reporting. However, a lot of us are confused as what the purpose of the Glasgow Coma Scale is for. The GCS was created in uh, Maryland at the R. Adams Cali Shock Trauma Center as a way to assess for neurological deficits. So many times we see patients we transport every day documented as a GCS of 15. However, many of these GCSs are incorrect. The Glasgow Coma Scale assesses three type of functions, eye opening, motor response, and verbal response. So many patients we encounter on a daily basis will have eyes open spontaneously. So we would assess them at a score of four. A patient who is verbally responsive, is oriented to person, place, and time, would get a five. Or if there's a slight hint of confusion, we might assess them as a four. Where we fail most often is on the motor response. Many paramedics and EMTs only look for one extremity. Give you an example, if we have a patient who is paralyzed on one side of the body, but they have a 
the other side of the body is functioning properly and they can follow commands. Many EMTs and paramedics would go ahead and give a score of six. But the Glasgow Coma Scale was created to assess all extremities. Remember, this is a tool to assess neurological deficits. So if we have one side of the body that cannot follow command, then we would assess the lowest score possible. We have to assess all extremities. Let's take a look at two examples of how the GCS is applied. Let's say we have an 18-year-old female who is involved in a motor vehicle accident, rollover with ejection. You arrive on scene and you find the patient lying on the ground. The patient is alert and oriented times four, has uh, eye response, uh, eyes are opening spontaneously, but you notice during your motor response assessment that the patient is paralyzed on one side of the body. You would assess that patient on the motor response as a one, so therefore the GCS would be a 10. Let's take the same scenario, but with an 80-year-old patient residing in a nursing home. You arrive to pick up a patient to transport them to a dialysis appointment. You note that the patient has spontaneous eye movement and is alert and oriented times four. But during the motor response assessment, you notice that the patient has paralysis on one side of the body. Would you assess them as a full GCS of 15 or would you assess them as a 10? Remember the GCS, we're looking for neurological deficits. So the appropriate uh, GCS score would be a 10 because we're looking for the lowest score assessing all four extremities. There are po positive neurological deficits present and so we would assess that patient as a 10. Recently, the Joint Commission has determined pain as the fifth vital sign. All patients must be asked and assessed for pain and discomfort. We need to be describing the pain. It may be physical discomfort that has characteristics of aching, pulling, tightness, burning, or pricking. You may, you, and you might explain that the pain may be mild or moderate or severe. Remember, pain is a subjective response to both physical and psychological stressors physical or emotional situations. The pain may be acute versus chronic. Every patient, and I say that again, every patient must receive a pain assessment and that must be documented in your PCR. We may not always be able to treat the pain. However, we still need to be asking every time we perform a set of vital signs if the patient is experiencing any pain or discomfort. Okay, let's talk about head to toe assessments. We're all familiar with the trauma assessment. We learned in EMT school and ITLS and PHTLS the DCAP, BLS, and TIC. That's great to use on primary and secondary surveys on trauma patients. But on medical patients, we also need to be performing the head to toe. We're going to look at the HEAT, the head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat. We're going to be assessing the head for skin color. We want to look at their skin moisture. Are they dry? Are they diaphoretic? We're going to look at the eyes and the pupils. Are they equal, round, and reactive to light? Are they symmetrical? We're also going to look at the patient's neck. Do they have any presence of J JVD or jugular venous distension? A lot of times medical patients, chronic medical patients, will have the presence of JVD. We also need to be looking at the chest. We want to describe the chest wall. We want to describe its shape. We want to describe the, the, the rise and fall. Is it equal? When we're auscultating breath sounds, we need to be assessing, are they normal or abnormal? We're going to listen to breath sounds over the tracheal region or the bronchial region which is above the thorax, the bronchiovesicular region, which is between the second and first intercostal space, the vesicular region, which is the lung fields. Remember, we're listening for abnormal or adventitious lung sounds. We need to know what those sound like. We need to be able to, to describe wheezing, crackles, rails, ronchi, strider, or pleural friction rubs. It's very important that we know what these sound like. Even though we may take a patient on a routine basis, sometimes twice a day, we still need to be assessing their lung sounds and documenting that appropriately. When we're assessing the abdomen on non-emergency patients, we need to be looking for rigidity, pulsating masses, distension, pain, or listening to bowel sounds when appropriate. Most often we do not assess the pelvis on non-emergency patients. However, on trauma patients, we do need to do a pelvic assessment. We don't do the pelvic rock anymore, but we do apply pressure to assess if there's any pain or rebound tenderness. Most commonly, we do not get a chance to look at the back of the patient. Uh, however, when you do get that opportunity, it's a good idea to go ahead and look, take a look to see if there are any decubitus ulcers or pressure sores. We do need to listen to lung sounds and the lung bases on the back of the patient when possible. Let's talk about extremities for a moment. 
This is an area where we fail to capture, a lot of times, a good assessment on patients. When we're looking at a patient's extremities, we really need to be taking a strong look at their muscle tone. Many patients who are elderly and are not active begin to lose muscle tone rather quickly. We call this muscle disuse atrophy. It's present in quite a few patients. I'll tell you a quick example. I transported a patient recently that is a well-known celebrity. The patient um, had, previous to the injury, uh, was a very healthy, active person. I was able to uh, meet this patient six weeks after the injury occurred. And what was amazing to me was to note that the patient's uh, muscle tone had decreased to the point that uh, the, the only comparison I could make that the patient looked like a, a, an image from a, a concentration camp or uh, an Auschwitz survivor. Uh, the muscle tone had uh, decreased so drastically that uh, if we were to measure their, their arms prior and, and post-injury, uh, at the time of transport, uh, we probably lost several inches. So it does not take long. It, it, muscle disuse atrophy starts setting in within a week to two weeks. So we really need to be looking at the uh, muscle tone. We also need to be looking at range of motion. Did the, does the patient have a limited range of motion? And most common, we fail to document that as well. When we're doing range of motion uh, exams, uh, we don't expect you to uh, lay the patient on the floor and do a full uh, degree scale uh, range for uh, uh, test for range of motion. However, we do need to ask the patient uh, to move their extremities uh, as just demonstrated here on the slide. We can ask the patient to uh, bend the knee and raise towards the chest. We can ask the patient to um, rotate uh, and the addu adduction of the hips. So can they go in and out? Um, we also need to ask them to uh, invert or evert their ankles and feet. We can inspect their feet and look for range of motion as well uh, on our own. Many times you'll be able to capture that information just by watching the patient, uh, especially on their uh, upper extremities. Uh, we can ask the patient to flex and extend passively and actively. We can ex ask them to pronate the forearms while the elbows are flexed or make fists with extended fingers, uh, flex or extend the wrist, and move hands laterally and medially. So when we meet a patient and we want to do an upper extremity uh, range of motion test, we can ask the patient to lift their arms out uh, in front of them, lift the arms to the side, raise the arms above their head. Those are really good indicators of range of motion, so we need to be asking the patient and documenting that appropriately. Here's an example of a chart provided to us by Medicare. Uh, we attended a conference recently that uh, some folks from Medicare uh, said that in the very near future, all non-emergency transports will be required to document range of motion. Uh, as you can see from the center of this graph, uh, there is a patient uh, laid out on a table. Uh, we don't expect that to be uh, possible in our industry. Uh, we're not physical therapists. However, uh, we need to do the best we can to describe the limits of range of motion. Uh, if we can put degrees of limitations, that would be great. But this needs to occur on every non-emergency patient you transport. Essentially, everyone that is not going to an emergency room, we need to be looking for decreased muscle tone and decreased range of motion. We also need to look at contractures. Many times we encounter patients that have contractures, but a lot of us fail to realize what causes contractures. Contractures are neurological deficits. And when neurological deficits are present, that needs to be documented and very well described in your patient care report. Contractures can be described as adducted internally rotated shoulders, flexed wrist, pronated forearm, clenched fist, flexed elbow, and thumb and palm deformity. As you can see on the chart here, you need to know what each one of these type of contractures looks like and how to describe it in your narrative. Many charts we review do not describe the contractures. Many charts do not even describe that contractures are present. This is a medical condition that would generate a condition code. Let's take a look at pressure sores and how to do pressure sore assessments. Many times when you encounter a patient in the field, they're going to have positive pressure sores. However, you will not be able to determine that because the, the wounds are bandaged and covered. That's where we need to be very good uh, investigators and ask the appropriate questions. We need to ask the patient, we need to ask the staff, and we need to roll the patient over and take a look at their back. Pressure sores are defined as localized injury to the skin or underlying tissue, usually over a bony prominence that is the result of pressure or pressure combined with the shear of friction. 
They could be stages one through four, and they could be located on the lateral side, heels, sacrum, buttocks, head, arms, elbows, and back. As you can see from this graph here, this is a patient lying on the patient's back, and you can see from the red indicators where pressure sores may develop. Now many of you watching this video are sitting in a chair. If you were to sit in that chair for an extended period of time, your buttocks would begin to hurt. The reason that occurs is because you're applying pressure to tissue. Imagine yourself as a patient lying in bed most of the time or sitting in a wheelchair most of the time. When you're not up and moving, you're applying pressure to that tissue. And as time goes on, pressure sores begin to develop. This graph shows what a stage one looks like. Stage one looks like a small scab. A stage two looks like a blister or a burn. A stage three begins to get into the upper layers of the skin tissue. And stage four is in the lower layers of the skin tissue or begins to get into the muscle tissue. Remember, many of the times that the patients have pressure sores present, they're going to be covered. They're going to be bandaged up and you will not be able to visualize them yourself. We don't expect you to remove the bandages to do a wound assessment. You need to do your best when asking these questions, asking the patient to determine. If a, if a pressure sore is bandaged up, most of the time it's an advanced stage, especially if the bandage is seeping uh, or there is uh, uh, fluid uh, uh, evacuating from the site itself. And the bandages have to be changed regularly. So we're going to have to ask those questions and do the best we can to document if the patient has a stage three or four uh, bed sore. We need to describe the exact location that all the pressure wounds or bed sores are present. When we're documenting patient history, a detailed assessment of the patient's medical history must be performed. This shall include all subjective information obtained from the patient. In addition, we need to get objective information from the medical staff, the patient's chart, the physician diagnosis report, and the MDS sheet when possible. Previous medical history is a good indicator of medical necessity for non-emergency transport. So when we're looking at previous medical history, we're looking at their diagnosis. Those codes that they are assigned when they're, they're diagnosis codes from the facility also translate over to the ambulance side. So that's why a history is very important. We also need to be asking medications. More importantly, we need to know what medications they're presently taking, what medications they're supposed to be taking that they're not, what medications they're taking that are not theirs or maybe over the counter, and we need to know that they're compliant with the appropriate dosage. We do a good job in EMS at asking what medications they're on. However, we fail commonly to uh, determine if they're taking their medications appropriately. Okay, now that we've talked about patient assessment, let's take a look at a couple common situations that occur in EMS. You may get a call at three o'clock in the morning to a nursing home for a patient that has critical labs. And the patient may be uh, sitting upright, alert and oriented, and in no uh, distress or discomfort. And you're asking yourself, why am I taking this patient to the hospital? This happens very frequently for medical and medical response. And most commonly when these charts are documented, we do not get paid for those. But what we really need to take a look at is why they're going to the hospital and what's really going on with the patient. Critical labs are defined by the Joint Commission as any result or finding that may be considered life-threatening or that could result in severe morbidity and require urgent and emergent clinical attention. So even though you may find the patient in a no distress, critical labs still are an emergency and require a, a visit to an emergency room. Abnormal labs are defined by the Joint Commission as a non-emergent, non-life-threatening result that needs attention and follow-up action as soon as possible. The most common critical labs that we encounter in EMS are hematocrit, potassium, hemoglobin, troponin, platelet count, white blood cell count, glucose, and calcium. This is an example of an actual lab report on an actual transport that was performed in our Mississippi operation. If you'll notice, the hematocrit is 19.7. It does indicate CL right next to it, and the normal range for hematocrit for this patient is 37 to 47. The hemoglobin is 6.7, again indicated as CL. The normal range should be 12 to 16. This patient is experiencing a medical emergency. However, the patient could present alert and oriented and in no distress. We are concerned as healthcare providers that this patient has potentially an internal bleed. This would be a life-threatening emergency and require transport to an emergency room. 
even though the labs may have been drawn 13 hours prior, by the time it's noted, they're assessed and reported back to the facility and the physician notified, it may be an extended period of time. That does not mean at 3 a.m. we still do not have to intervene and transport that patient to the hospital. Oftentimes, when we're transporting patients that have critical labs, we fail to document what the lab is, what the range was, what the normal range was, and what the results mean. That's why we're not getting reimbursement for many of these transports. So we have created this chart. This is called a lab value chart. You will find this in the ambulance, and each one of you will be provided this chart. If you notice in the column to the left, which states the name of the test, the column to their right of the name is the purpose. The middle column states the normal ranges. And the two right columns are the high results and low results mean. So we need to be documenting when we find these critical lab patients what the name of the test was, what the normal range is, what the patient's range is, and what the high results or low results mean. Let me give you an example. In the early 90s, paramedics were trained to document uh, rule out when they were transporting a patient. For instance, we would transport a patient with uh, chest pain, rule out AMI, or acute myocardial infarction. Uh, that changed in the late 90s as uh, it was determined that that was our way of diagnosing and we shouldn't be diagnosing. So they took that out of uh, paramedic standard practice. We're bringing that back for these critical labs. We're asking you to take a look at this chart when you transport patients with critical labs and document what the high results can mean. So for example, we could say when the patient on the previous slide that has a low hematocrit, low hemoglobin, we would transport documenting that the patient has a low hematocrit hemoglobin, document their range, and state that the patient is being transported to rule out the potential for internal bleed. That, doc that information right there gives the coders uh, good information to code that chart appropriately, therefore we would uh, get paid. Uh, but when we fail to capture that information and we state that we're just transporting a patient with critical labs, the coders are not able to capture any information and we just document it with minimal codes and most often it results in no reimbursement. Let's talk about feeding tubes for a moment. Uh, we transport feeding tubes quite commonly in patients who have feeding tubes. Uh, we need to understand the different types of feeding tubes. As you can see in the slide, a patient could have an NG tube, a PEG tube, a J-tube or a G-tube. When we get called out for these patients at a skilled nursing facility that has a G-tube or uh, PEG tube pulled, it needs to be reinserted. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see that it is a surgical incision from the exterior of the body into the stomach of the patient. So when this tube is pulled, we now have an ostomy or an opening from the exterior of the body to the stomach. That's why this is considered a medical emergency and it must be replaced by a licensed physician. Commonly, an x-ray would need to be performed to determine that the placement was uh, confirmed placement. So that's why this is a medical emergency. We also need to be cognizant of the fact that with an ostomy, we could develop infection. The patient become, could become septic. That's why these go to the hospital by ambulance. We should also be familiar with tubes, trachs, and ostomies. Very common, we transport trach patients, even patients who can walk that have a trach. The reason that trach patients go by stretcher is because we have to be able to perform airway management. Uh, trach patients are, are uh, notorious for developing mucus plugs that they potentially could not clear. That's why we take them with uh, EMT or paramedic in the back so we could clear their airway if necessary. Colostomy patients, are that is not a condition that requires ambulance transport. However, you still need to be aware of colostomy uh, patients and, and what those entail. Chest tubes, uh, that is a paramedic skill, um, and we need to understand uh, and document appropriately uh, how to transport chest tubes and um, what we've had to do with those chest tubes en route. So when documenting patient assessments, we need to be documenting the complete head to toe. We're looking for the pertinent findings, the pertinent negatives, we're looking for neurological deficits, we're looking for limited range of motion, decreased muscle tone, and the Glasgow Coma Scale. Here's a sample non-emergency assessment that you could document in your narrative. Patient presents conscious and confused with a GCS of 13. Cognitive deficits are present and the patient is agitated and aggressive. 
Heat is clear, pink, warm, and dry. Pupils equal and reactive to light. No tracheal deviation, no JVD. Chest is clear, symmetrical rise and fall. Lung sounds were clear with upper bibasal rails. Patient has stage three decubitus ulcers to the lower back, buttocks, and heels. And the abdomen was soft, non-tender, with no distension or rigidity. Pelvis was stable. Upper extremities were weak with limited range of motion due to muscle disuse atrophy. The patient is unable to flex or extend extremities without assistance. And the patient has bilateral above the knee amputations. This represents a sample of an assessment narrative. And it's not the complete narrative, but this is a good tool to uh, for you to use when documenting your assessments of non-emergency patients. Let's take a look at a couple of patients and do a practice assessment. Uh, this patient here, I, I do notice several things that uh, are red flags. Number one, the patient is inappropriately restrained. We would never want to restrain a patient uh, like this. But let's take a look at their potential medical conditions. If you look to the right of your screen, you'll notice the patient's arm is very, very skinny. That would be a good indicator of um, muscle disuse atrophy, decreased muscle tone. Uh, as this patient is aged and uh, does not use his uh, uh, upper extremities uh, in everyday life, uh, his muscle tone has really started to decrease and muscle disuse atrophy is set in. Uh, you'll notice the patient is uh, hunched forward. We don't know why that is, but that could be kyphosis. We also notice if you look at the patient's right hand that the uh, fingers are uh, protracted inward that could be a contracture or a neurological deficit. At first glance at this patient, and we're not going to be able to get a whole lot of information just by looking at this patient, we can tell that she does have uh, good muscle tone, uh, but she is leaning to the right. So my first question would be, is she asleep? Has she had a stroke? We don't know those questions. We don't know what her range of motion is. But when we're doing our, our first uh, impression, I can tell that she's leaning to the right, she is hunched forward, and there potentially is a medical problem going on with the patient. If we look at example number three, we notice a gentleman sitting in a wheelchair. Uh, he does have a restraining table, he is hunched forward, um, and he also has some medical shoes on. That would indicate to me that this patient um, probably has some psychological problems or some neurological deficits because he's got the restraining table. We notice that he is leaned forward. Um, so he may not be able to maintain upright stability, maintain truncal control. Uh, he may have a lack of co coordination or unsteady gait, unsteady balance. That would be a good indicator of why he's in the wheelchair. But looking at the medical shoes, he also uh, would potentially, could potentially have uh, pressure sores on his heels. Now let's watch a video of a patient with, uh, that is experiencing some dementia and confusion. And let's see how you would note this patient in your record. As we just watched in the video, you noted a patient who had extremely uh, aggressive behavior. He was uh, confused at his location. Um, he uh, was having thoughts that weren't congruent with reality. And so this would be an extreme example of a patient with dementia or confusion. Most common, though, most of the elderly patients we transport will not have this degree of confusion. You might encounter this type of patient in a lockdown unit at a skilled nursing facility. However, most of the patients that you meet will not be in a lockdown skilled facility, but will still have some degree of confusion. We need to be looking very closely for that. Now let's take a look at patient care report common issues. It's very important that we capture accurate demographic information. We need the patient's legal name. For example, if a patient tells you his name is Chuck, but his legal name is Charles, we cannot bill that patient's claim under the name of Chuck. We would have to be billed under his legal name. We wouldn't know his legal name if it's not documented here. We need to focus and make sure we get good demographics. First name, last name, correct spelling, social security number, date of birth, gender. This information is very important. We also need to be aware of time discrepancies. The times you enter in your ESO EPCR need to match what is in the CAD. We need to make sure that these times are accurate and honest. When talking about time discrepancies, it's important to note that we are monitoring shoot times. Our policy states you have one minute to respond during the day and three minutes at night. We monitor in increments of 20 minutes. So for instance, anytime there is a response, a scene time, 
a transport or a destination time greater than 20 minutes, it must be accounted for in the CAD system. So we will make notes any time that those times are out of the uh, ordinary. You must capture a patient signature on each and every transport. No longer are we permitted to write patient unable to sign. EMTs and paramedics are no longer allowed to sign on behalf of the patient. We need to focus on capturing the patient's signature when possible. If the patient is unable to sign, we are legally permissible to obtain an authorized representative. An authorized representative could be a legal guardian, a medical power of attorney, a relative or other person who receives or handles benefits on behalf of the patient. It could be a relative or other person who arranges treatment or assists the patient on their patient affairs. Or it could be a representative of the healthcare agency, whether the receiving facility or the accepting facility or the sending facility. Once we capture an authorized representative signature, we need to document their name and the reason that the patient is unable to sign. When crew member signatures are required in the EPCR, we are not permitted to use initials. It has to be an actual signature of the employee's name so do not document initials. This is a Medicare standard. When we arrive at the receiving facility, we need to capture a signature from the nurse or physician receiving the patient. We would need to document the nurse's or physician's name in the chart as well. Also, we would ask for a signature that they've received all the patient paperwork or any of the patient's personal property. For transports that destinated a facility and that we could not receive a signature from the patient, we would also ask the nurse to sign stating that the patient was unable to sign the patient care report. One of the most common errors on EPCRs that result in denials is the run type. If you notice in the column on the left, the run types, they're actually a national NIMSA standard is 911 emergency, intercept, emergency interfacility transfer, non-emergency interfacility transfer medical transport, mutual aid, or standby. Also, the column to the right shows the EMD complaint. We need to make sure we're getting good and accurate information in both of these tabs. So when discussing the run type, any transport that results in a transport to an emergency room must be marked as emergency. It doesn't matter whether lights and sirens are used. Any transport to an emergency room must be marked as the run type of emergency. All stat hospital to hospital transfers must be marked as an emergency interfacility transfer. This would be a transport to another ER or to a cath lab. Anything that is considered stat or urgent in nature, nature needs to be marked as an emergency interfacility transfer. All non-urgent hospital to hospital transfers must be marked as non-emergency interfacility transfer. So a routine casual transfer to a, another facility for a patient that's going to be admitted to a floor or being admitted to a specialty hospital or LTAC would be marked as a non-emergent, non-urgent transfer. All other transports would be marked as a medical transport. This includes doctor's office visits, dialysis transports, flight crew transports, discharges to a nursing home or assisted living facility or a residence. Anything that's going to a residence or back to a nursing home would be considered a medical transport. Medicare is now requiring the EMD complaint to be listed in the PCR. The EMD complaint will be given to you by the communication center upon original dispatch. It must be documented in the PCR listed as shown on the screen. Here is an example of the EMD dispatch codes we use at Medical and Medical Response. These are the codes, again, that the dispatch staff take and categorize calls into. This will be given to you by the comm staff upon being dispatched these have to be put in your EPCR. Lately we've had some concerns with patient personal property. Many accusations have been made of wallets missing, purses missing, missing dentures, canes, uh, hearing aids, etc. One way to avoid this is to document under the personal items tab any patient property you transport. You would simply click add and document a description of what the personal property is. Upon arriving at the receiving facility or the residence or wherever, you need to have someone sign that they have received the patient's personal property. This will eliminate any accusations or any uh, thoughts that we may have lost their property en route. Under the assessment tab, we need to be documenting an accurate and thorough initial and ongoing assessment. If you notice on the, the slide on the screen here, 
where we're looking at mental status, no abnormalities, skin, no abnormalities, or back, not assessed. We need to be performing head-to-toe assessments on each and every one of these patients and their body parts that are affected. We would document any pertinent findings or pertinent negatives. Anything that's in the narrative of the assessment would need to be documented here and vice versa. If it's documented on the assessment tab, it needs to be listed in your narrative as well. Now we're going to discuss medical necessity criteria for non-emergency transport. This criteria was determined by Medicare and Medicaid. The medical necessity criteria applies to discharges, doctor's office visits, nursing home admissions, or anywhere Medicare or Medicaid is the payer source for the ambulance transport. Transports to an emergency room and hospital or hospital to hospital transfers have different requirements that are not included in this criteria. Commercial insurance or contracted facility transports are not required to meet this specific medical necessity criteria. Let's take a look at what Medicare and Medicaid consider medical necessity criteria for non-emergency transport. They basically state that their two conditions must be present. Either the patient is bed confined or cannot be safely transported by another means. To be considered for bed confined status, a patient would have to qualify under, qualify under three categories. Either they are unable to get up from bed without assistance, unable to ambulate, and unable to sit in a wheelchair without restraint or for duration of transport. Again, for bed confined status, we can't say bed confined. They have to meet these three criteria and those three sentences would have to be documented in the narrative. If the patient doesn't meet bed confined status, other conditions could be present that would warrant transportation by a stretcher. Those could be altered mental status or altered level of consciousness, cognitive deficits, confusion, dementia or Alzheimer's, patients in a comatose or vegetative state, the patient could have an unsteady gait, a lack of coordination, or poor torso control. The patient could have uh, lasting or acute effects from a CVA or stroke. The patient could have a trach that requires airway monitoring, management, or suctioning. They could have uh, contractures present, or bed sores, or pressure ulcers, decubitus ulcers on the back or buttocks, unhealed or unconfirmed fractures, or above or below the knee amputations. Oxygen administration may be required, and the patient is unable to self-administer. The patient may have the presence of severe muscular weakness or neuromuscular deficits. The patient could be unable to tolerate a seated position for the time needed to transport, or unable to maintain upright or trunkal stability. Could also, if the patient is experiencing moderate to severe pain upon movement, or is seizure prone or has conditions that may cause seizures. If the patient is combative, or a flight risk, or danger to themselves or others or restrained or need restraints. The patient could have received a chemical restraint or a sedative medication throughout the day like Haldol or Ativan or any mind altering drug. Isolation precautions may be required due to MRSA, C. diff, VRE or TB. The patient may have malignant cancer that is present that is metastasized to other or multiple locations. Anytime malignant brain cancer or tumor is present, that's an instant qualifier or any other condition where the patient cannot be safely transported by another means. This is the medical necessity criteria that Medicare and Medicaid has determined would warrant a transportation by ambulance via a stretcher. So why is the narrative so important? We at Medic One place a lot of importance on the narrative. We ask that you put a lot of information in the narrative that you may capture elsewhere in the chart. Well, the narrative is very important because it paints the whole picture of what is wrong with the patient and what you did for them. The statements made in the narrative is how the ticket is coded for billing. If it's not in the narrative, it didn't happen, and it's not coded by the billing, billing team. The narrative qualifies if the patient is needed to be transported by ambulance. It proves that medical necessity was there. If it's not written, it did not happen. Your PCR is a medical record and can be subpoenaed. And you need to remember, the way that these tickets are billed is by billing coders reviewing what's in your narrative. And for every condition you list, Every terminology, every phrase that identifies that patient or describes the patient results in a code. The more codes we have, especially codes that meet the Medicare Medicaid criteria, the better likelihood that the report will result in reimbursement. And that's what we need to focus on. Every non-emergency transport is required to have the medical necessity assessment form completed. Every time you fill out a transport, go down to the custom forms tab under the signature section of your EPCR. You will see the medical necessity assessment form. It is a series of conditions with a checkbox. 
take your stylist and check each present condition that you see. If you check any of these conditions, they need to be documented in your narrative. As a reminder, this form must be completed on every non-emergency transport. For transports that are going hospital to hospital, we have the hospital to hospital necessity form. This is a series of questions that you would answer yes or no to, plus check boxes that indicate the services provided at the receiving facility. For example, question number one, is this patient being transported for an upgrading care? Most commonly, hospital to hospital transfers are an upgrading care, so you would circle yes. Is the accepting hospital the closest appropriate facility that has an accepting physician and bed availability? If that were true, you would circle yes. If it were not, you would circle no. Any of the yeses that you circle yes to need to be documented in your narrative. And down at the bottom we would list the services that the patient will receive at the receiving facility. Medicare and Medicaid requires a physician certification statement or a PCS form to be completed on all non-emergency transfers. This includes hospital discharges, hospital transfers, doctor's office visits, each leg of the transport, and dialysis transports. The patient's primary care physician must be listed on the PCS. A single-use PCS or a one-time transport PCS can be signed by a physician, an MD or DO, or a PA or nurse practitioner, a registered nurse, or a discharge planner or case manager. You as the employee must get a PCS form signed on every non-emergency transport. Now let's discuss documentation methods. Some of us were taught to use the SOAP method, some of us were taught to use CHART, or what we prefer at Medical and Medical Response, the chronological order, and some folks use a plan of care, which is a nursing or critical care transport form of documentation. Remember, all narratives must include a head-to-toe assessment, pain assessment, pertinent findings, and pertinent negatives. All non-emergency narratives must list medical necessity for ambulance transport. These may be observed in the assessment. Some anchor phrases that you could use to describe present medical conditions for patients are severe muscular weakness. That would need to be described in more detail, whether it's upper body, lower body, limited range of motion, poor muscle tone, limited or decreased range of motion, unsteady gait, unsteady balance, lack of coordination, poor torso control, poor trunkal stability, and muscle disuse atrophy. Remember, these, these conditions must be present and must be truthful to be documented in your narrative but these are good phrases to use to describe these conditions. So let's take a look at a sample narrative of an emergency transport. Remember, emergency has nothing to do with lights and sirens. When we say emergency or emergent for billing purposes, we mean going to an emergency room. Medic 900 was dispatched to a private residence for chest pain. Arrived at scene to find a 47-year-old female sitting on the couch, conscious alert oriented times four, complaining of left-sided chest pain that radiates into the neck. Pain began approximately 25 minutes prior to EMS. Patient states pain is an 8 on a 1 to 10 scale. Patient denies nausea but complains of shortness of air. Paramedic assessment. Patient heat clear, pale, warm with moderate diaphoresis. Pupils are equal reactive to light, zero JVD, zero tracheal deviation. Chest is clear with symmetrical rise and fall. Lung sounds were rapid and shallow with slight bibasal rails. The abdomen was soft, non-tender, no distension or no rigidity. Moves all extremities well times four with good CMS. Patient SpO2 was 97% room air. Cardiac monitor shows sinus tachycardia with no ventricular ectopy. A 12 lead was performed and indicates left anterior wall injury patterns. 324 milligrams of aspirin was administered and an IV of normal saline was established in number, eight, number 18 right AC. 3.4 milligram nitro were administered with pain decreasing to a two. 2 milligrams of morphine sulfate was administered with pain at a zero. Patient color improved and the diaphoresis subsided. Patient was transported to Methodist ER and route cath team was activated and upon arrival, patient was transported directly to the cath lab. Patient remained alert and hemodynamically stable during transport report and care given to Betty RN. This is a prime example of how we should be writing narratives in which the patient is transported to an emergency room. Not only did we describe a complete history of the patient's symptoms. We described the patient's symptoms in very detail. We did a thorough head-to-toe assessment on the patient. We described what we did. It's, it's important to note we didn't document times in the narrative. That's not necessary because we check boxes throughout the patient care report of when we do an intervention. So we don't need times in the narrative. 
You're certainly welcome to add those if you want to, but it's not required. This was a very thorough report. And one thing to point out, notice that the patient's pain was at a zero. We kept treating the pain until they were pain free. That should be our goal on chest pain patients. Let's take a look at another emergent transport. Again, remember it has nothing to do with lights and sirens. This means we're going to the emergency room. Medic 900 was dispatched to Acme Nursing Home for a sick person. Arrived on scene to find a 72-year-old male sitting upright in a recliner. Patient presents alert and oriented, complaining of a headache. Staff at the ECF states the patient has been febrile the previous day. The patient has a history of a recent sinus infection. The patient's physician requested labs drawn. Lab CBC report shows a significantly elevated white blood count of 18,600. Patient is being transported to the ER for evaluation to rule out infection. Paramedic assessment, heat clear, pink warm to touch and dry. Pupils equal reactive delight, no JVD. Chest, no abnormalities, symmetrical rise and fall. Lung sounds were clear, equal bilaterally. Abdomen was soft, non-tender with no distension or rigidity. Moves extremities well times four with good CMS. Room, O2, SPO, room air SpO2 is 95%. Axillary temp was 101 degrees. Patient has a history of IDDM, CHF, CABG, and ESRD. Finger stick blood sugar is 78 milligrams per deciliter. O2 applied via nasal cannula at four liters per minute with an SpO2 of 98%. Cardiac monitor shows AFib, IV of normal saline, established number 18 left forehand times one. Patient was transported, priority two ALS, to Methodist ER. In route, patient remained alert and hemodynamically stable. No acute changes or incident occurring. Upon arrival, patient care report given to Nancy RN. Again, very good report. We describe what happened to the patient. We describe that the patient, uh, we were dispatched for a sick person, which is our EMD code. We also described how we found the patient. Uh, the patient is alert nor, and it complains of simply a headache, had a fever the previous day. But the labs were drawn. This was a critical labs call. Patient's labs were 18,600. We even documented to rule out. So we've, we've told whoever's reviewing this chart why we're taking the patient to the ER for an evaluation and what their potential lab results could, could mean. We also did a paramedic assessment. That's a good practice for every paramedic to get into. Anytime we transport a patient to an emergency room, we need to put that phrase in our narrative, paramedic assessment. Now let's take a look at a sample narrative of a non-emergency transport. These are transports that are going to somewhere other than emer an emergency room. Medic 900 was dispatched to Acme Nursing Home to transport a patient to dialysis. Arrived to find a 72-year-old male lying in bed. Patient presents confused with no complaints. Patient is being transported to DeVita Central Dialysis for hemodialysis. Patient has a history of end-stage renal disease, cancer of the lung, CHF, dementia, NIDDM, and diabetic neuropathy. EMT assessment, heat was clear, pink, warm, and dry. There was positive JVD, chest symmetrical rise and fall with moderate ronchi and congestion auscultated upon inspiration. Abdomen was soft and non-tender. Extremities were weak with upper and lower, decreased muscle tone, and decreased range of motion due to muscle disuse atrophy. Patient was transferred to stretcher via draw sheet and secured rails times two straps times five. Upon arrival at the dialysis clinic, patient was draw sheet transferred to the dialysis recliner. Patient requires ambulance transport due to being unable to get up from bed without assistance, unable to ambulate, unable to support self safely in a wheelchair for duration of transport. Patient has severe upper and lower body muscular weakness, decreased muscle tone, and decreased limited range of motion due to muscle disuse atrophy. Patient is considered a high fall risk and has altered mental status with the GCS of 14. Patient receives sedative medications, 0.5 milligrams of Ativan, PO daily, and has a fentanyl patch. So here again, we've got a great stellar example of a narrative for a non-emergent transport. We describe the patient's head-to-toe assessment in detail. We start at the head, work down. We know the patient's positive for JVD, has uh, moderate ronchi, and congestion is auscultated upon inspiration. We know that the extremities are weak, upper and lower, with a decreased range of motion, due to muscle disuse atrophy. We've described in detail. We've also, as per policy, listed the second paragraph. Remember, each and every non-emergent transport you do, we must include a second paragraph that states, this patient requires ambulance transport due to. 
and we listed that in absolute detail. And here's our last sample narrative of a non-emergency transport. Medic 900 dispatched Priority 3 to Methodist Hospital, room 212, to transport a patient back to a residence. Patient presented to ER on 725 via EMS complaining of fatigue, dizziness, and weakness. Patient was negative for CVA but was admitted due to anemia. Patient had a low hematocrit and hemoglobin post hip surgery two days prior. The hematocrit was 28 and the hemoglobin was 6. Patient H&H &H has improved during the hospital stay and the patient has no complaints. Patient is being discharged back to the residence. EMT assessment, heme clear, positive JVD. Skin color appears slightly jaundiced. Chest symmetrical rise and fall with adequate respiratory effort. Lung sounds are clear equal bilaterally. Abdomen distended, non-tender. Upper extremities noted good CMS. Lower extremities, we noted a shortened and rotated left leg due to recent hip replacement. Patient, unsecure, patient secured to stretcher via draw sheet, five straps, two rails. Patient transported without incident. Upon arrival at the residence, patient was transported up to bed and moved via two-man sheet pole. This patient requires ambulance transport due to post-hip replacement. Patient is non-weight bearing and cannot sit upright due to recent non-healed hip replacement. Again, prime example, good narrative. Not only did we list the head to toe, but we hit a key point here. We picked a patient up from a hospital. We documented why the patient was in the hospital, what happened to them. We even documented the reason they were admitted, which was the critical labs. We, we indicated the, the labs have improved, and now the patient's being discharged back. We know why they qualify for an ambulance, because they're not, they're not able to sit in a wheelchair or in a vehicle because of the recent hip replacement. The four examples we just discussed will result in reimbursement. We want to get paid for these transports, as we should. These are legally billable transports. So we need to capture this information. Everything listed in these tickets, as I've stated previously, are data information that coders can data mine this narrative. If we were to go through this chart here, this example of transport, let's see how many qualifiers we could get uh, as far as uh, condition codes. We'll go through it again and see. So the patient's uh, dizzy and weak. There's two right there. They had low hematocrit hemoglobin. So there's the third. Um, they have the presence of JVD. There's four. Jaundice, there's five. Uh, let's see. They have a distended abdomen. There's six. We've got a shortened rotated left leg. There's seven. And unable to weight bear. So there's eight. And we know it's a recent hip replacement. So there's nine. So just by capturing good information, we can code this appropriately and make sure that reimbursement is obtained. Since there is a strong emphasis on narratives here at Medic One Medical Response, we've discovered some employees have been creative in creating workarounds. It is never permitted, never acceptable to cut and paste narratives. At no point should you store narratives on a flash drive and plug that into the laptop and cut and paste a narrative. We certainly don't mind you using a standard format on each one of your narratives, as most people's narratives look similar in nature. However, never is it permissible to cut and paste a narrative. This will result in immediate corrective action and reporting to the state. In closing, I would like to remind you of our corporate compliance program. Medic One Medical Response is committed to maintaining the highest standards of ethical conduct and to strictly comply with the guidelines, rules, and regulations that govern our business practices. Medic One Medical Response is corporate responsibility to drive the core values of integrity, ethical behavior, professionalism, and trustworthiness allows us to demonstrate our commitment to compliance excellence and exemplary corporate citizenship. Anytime you are aware of a suspected violation or potential violation of not only our corporate compliance program, but any rules, regulations that affect billing or reimbursement, we ask that you contact this 1-800 number, which is 1-800-983-6153. It is available 24 hours a day, and you can leave an anonymous message. Or you can send an email via compliance at mediconeresponse.com. That concludes our discussion on stellar patient care reports. Remember, how you document is how we get paid. We need to capture every dollar legally possible for each and every transport we perform. We appreciate your help in making sure that this is done properly. 
And if you have any questions, please consult one of the members of our Billing Quality Assurance Team or your supervisor. Thank you for your time.